and me. Today's value statement for today. Write this down. Look, turn over your bulletin on the back side. It has little blank spaces there. And this is our value statement for today. Amen. And we, I'm excited about this because this sums up all the value statements. If we could come up with one value statement, this would be the one. That we could say, this is what we need to do for the kingdom of God. This is how we should, if we uh, embrace this value statement, it will change our lives. And it will change the lives of others around us. This is the one. It, I said a couple weeks ago, I thought hospitality was the main one because we wanted everybody to be accepted. That was my favorite because I look at this church saying, hey, everybody's accepted. I don't care if you're rich or poor. I don't care what country you come from. I don't care about your background. I know God loves you, and we want to embrace that in this church. But this one tops that. I really believe it. Let's look. We value leading people to follow Jesus. Say it with me. We value leading people to follow Jesus. All right? That Jesus held nothing back so that people can be right with God. Jesus held nothing back. He completed the mission that God sent him on. He died on the cross willfully so you, the world can be saved. Amen? And I believe that. So if you look at our church, how many like, hey, we got a nice-sized church here. This is really nice, right? Now, if you think this is the right nice-sized church, you have a small vision of what God has for the world. Yeah. God sees this church packed, the next church packed, the church down the road packed, every house packed with people following Jesus, amen? God has a bigger vision of what we have. We need to grasp the vision of God, that every soul in the world right now needs to have. Just reminded, when I get, you ever get on a plane, you ever hear a, a, a radio contact with the tower and the plane, the pilot on the plane? He says to the, he says to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the tower, he says, do we have 80 souls on board? Right? Mm -hmm. It's like a communication from the tower, right? I feel like we have 2,500, 2,500, 2, I mean, 25,000 people, 250,000 people, yes. excuse me, I was getting my, my math messed up, in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm the pilot. I'm saying to God, not everybody's on board yet. All right? We have to win the whole city for Jesus, amen? We can't believe it. God has a bigger vision. Of this. I want you to turn to Matthew, uh, if you will, in your Bibles, Matthew chapter uh, 9. And I want to remind us of what Jesus did as he looked at the world, the world looked at him. Amen? And this is really awesome because Pastor Andy shared last week about him going into the gay bar and sharing his love, sharing with friends that invite him there and, and build a relationship with them. Amen? And even though he was there, that he was able just to befriend them. And I thought, well, being a friend of sinners is like really kind of what we should be doing. We should know people that don't know Jesus so we can lead them to Jesus. And whatever it, wherever that takes us, we don't have to partake in the event. We just have to be a light there. Amen? I tell you, you don't have to be a sinner. You don't have to act like a sinner. Just be with them. Love on them. Present Jesus as God gives opportunity. But sometimes it takes building a relationship with people. Look at Matthew chapter 9 and um, verse 9 through 12. It says, as Jesus went on from there, he, he called Matthew as a disciple right before this. He, was, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. He said to him, follow me. He told, uh, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors, which the Jewish people hated them because they were like half, they were like, gave their souls to the Roman government. They were collecting taxes for them. So they were like sinners. They were bad people. Nobody likes the IRS anyway, right? No, just kidding. All right, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, who were the Pharisees? They were like the, the Jewish ruling class, the religious people at the time, and they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Oh, hearing this, I'm hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He was taken right there, he said, I don't care about the law, I'm fulfilling the law. I have mercy on everyone. Hallelujah. He came that every sick person, every person that is lost, every person that is broken hearted, every person that is, is in sin, sinful relationship, every, every person in the world, Christ came for them. And he, he hung out with them. He ate dinner with them. I think of Zacchaeus. He went into Zacchaeus' house. He was a tax collector too. And Jesus hung out with them. Why? Because they needed him. Think about the people that you know in your life. You, they need you. They need you to share Jesus with them. They need you to, to uh, hang out with them. When they invite you, I, I, I was, we talked about doing like outreaches and doing things. 
And when your lost friends invite you to a party, go. Right? You don't have to drink a beer with them. You can just hang out with them. Right? I've been to many bars. I drink a lot of Coke. You know? And everybody thought I was the coolest guy ever because they knew I was a preacher. Right? But they, they, you were here. Why are you here? Why are you in this bar? I'm like, because I love you. <laughs> okay, dude. Whatever. I didn't really say it that way. But you know what I'm saying? I just want to know I cared about them. And I want to hear about their families. And I want to hear about their lives and their children. And that's where you find out those things. And that's... What we did and what happened? You have an opportunity then to lead some to Jesus. How many think that's totally crazy? I'm a Christian. I shouldn't really, I should, I'm in the world, but not of the world. I have to preach that, right? So we should hang out with people. But listen, you can be in that situation and not be like them, right? There's something different in you. Something God created when He came in, a spirit came in you that they desire. You smile, you laugh, you joke, you hang on, you, you, you drive them home when they're drunk, whatever. You know, you take care of them like you're their family. And eventually, I'm telling you, eventually, they'll want to know why, and then you can ask, tell them, because it's God that saved me, the God that changed my life, the same God that loves you unconditionally, and you need to share that with them. Amen. Look at uh, um, John 3, verse 17, or 16 and 17, and most of us know this one, but I just want to emphasize something. I, I use, I, I, Drill this in my family's head all my life. Every time I taught children's church, I would check. This kids would have to memorize this portion of scripture because everybody knows John three sixteen, don't we? For God so loved the world, right? And for God, in verse seventeen, I just want to concentrate. Well, let look how we sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in, in Him shall not perish but have what eternal life. So the question is. It, it, we want to teach people how to believe believers. But look at verse 17. And this is so non-condemning to the unbeliever. Right? Because everybody thinks the church judges them. Why don't they go to church? Like, I feel judged. I feel like, you know, people are looking at me. I'm not, I don't dress like they do. I don't act like they do. I don't, have, I don't look good enough. But this is so uncondemning. And so relieving to them. I love sharing this. I love sharing it slow when I talk to them and let them look on their face when it changes to he's judging me, but then he's not judging me. I love that look. I don't know if you ever had it after you lead somebody to Jesus, but this is really awesome. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. God's not judging you. God loves you. That's what this whole chapter, chapter 3 is about. God loves you. God loves you. Everyone in this room, God loves you unconditionally. There's nothing, if you're the, in a worse place you could ever be right now, God loves you. If you're in the best place with God, like you are like holding, you walk on water, man, God loves you too, right? I mean, he loves everyone. That's why he sent Jesus to come to the world. That's why he provided his death so we could come to him. Because we have a restored relationship with God, our, our Father. I was thinking about Lori. She was a young lady. Some of you have heard the story, and I'm just going to share just a short part. Lori came to live with us. Lori was a young mom uh, living on the street. Her husband kicked her out of the house. She had three kids living in an a, a abandoned home downtown in, in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Anyway, she came to our church. I don't know how she got there, but anyway, Tina and I felt like we need to adopt this little girl, this young lady. She got pregnant when she was 14, uh, then 16, and then 18, I think is what the eight when her babies were born. Her, she had uh, no, no medical care. You know, she had just she was really in a bad place. But somehow she reached out to somebody in the church that she wanted there. And we just fell in love with her instantly, like we need to do something. So we're washing dishes one day, and I said, uh, Tina's, you know, oh, marriage conference is coming up, right? The, I think the worst thing for, mar for a married couple is to have a dishwasher. <laughs> yeah, because in the old days, you just the, hus the wife would wash the dishes and the husband would dry the dishes. I'm just telling you this, you know, this suggestion anyway. And then while the wife was washing the dishes, she, her hands are busy, <coughs> so your hands could be busy too. So yeah, just a, just a suggestion. But anyway, uh, we were washing dishes that day, and I said to Tina, I said, you know what, I think we should have Lori come live with us. And she, you know God, how God does it. He doesn't just speak to the one, he speaks to both. Uh -huh. She said, I, I was thinking the exact same thing. And so from that day forward, we were able to bring Lori all messed up life, craziness, dirty person. I mean, everything you could think of that she had in her life was just crazy, and we just embraced her. <laughs> and the day that she moved in, she had, we had, uh, I'm just telling how messy it was, we had, uh, uh, 
lice, right? Bed lice or whatever, what do you call them? Lice. Lice. No. Yeah. Yeah. The bed no was the no no was in her hair. It yeah, lice, lice, right? Lice. So lice was all in the house. It was like if, if, so all the kids got to have the bath. We got to wash all the laundry. We got to do all the, the linen, everything, Stuff you know. So I'm saying, bed. you know, God didn't say you had to clean the fish up. He just bring the fish in, catch the fish. Go out there and win the up, save the unsaved, bring them in. They're going to be messy. There's going to be things that are going to be, maybe you don't like. It's not part of your culture or something different about it. But, you know, bring them in. God will clean them up. Lori's two sons that were are now in full-time ministry. Lori's married now, has a, a wonderful life in Idaho. Just amazing. We got to see her uh, last year. She came and visited us. We haven't seen her for 15, 20 years. And it was just amazing how she's just recalled. Uh, moment after moment, how we had helped her, what we did, and how we discipled her. And I remember as she started getting excited about Jesus, and God started changing her heart, and she, she changed. She wanted to go to the uh, uh, this bar called Thunderbird. We wouldn't let her because she wasn't ready yet. And she was like, well, all my, but this is what she said, all my lost friends are there. God had touched her so much in her heart that she wanted her friends that she's a part of with come to know Jesus. And eventually they did, but it would, we waited just a little bit longer. I'm telling you, God wants to save the world. He's not here to condemn the world. He's, he's here to save the world. And you and I are the ones that can help him do that. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I think today, not only we're going to talk about the law. I think today, and even in your own life, this could be a day that can be changing. This is a day that we can examine who we are, and then say, Whew, maybe I'm just not right. Maybe my heart isn't right. Maybe there's something there that's holding me back from being what Jesus wants to be. Jesus saved you to be a light to the world. He didn't save you for just to sit in church, right? Everybody know that? I mean, it's great. We're saved. I mean, I, I'm not going to hell. I really know that. I mean, I had a messed up life, and God changed my life. Called me to be a preacher. I can't believe it. I still laugh sometimes. It's amazing what God can do. He changes us. Yeah. He wants to change you and me today. So maybe today there's some things in your life that are holding you back from being close to God. And I think today is the day that God wants to get rid of that so you can be the light of the world. Amen? Hallelujah. So you can continue to work for Him. So I just want to remember with last, uh, let's go to Mark. Chapter 2. This is kind of the heart I, I want to see develop in us, in our, in our church family. And uh, just chapter 2, Mark, it talks about the, uh, uh, this, these four guys had this friend that was crippled. Jesus was in his hometown, and all these people gathered at this house. And he gathered, they gathered there, wanted to listen to the words of Jesus, and Jesus was sharing from, from, and teaching at that time. And these four guys had this friend that couldn't walk, and they knew because of Jesus did all these miracles in this town, or and through different areas of the in that area, and they wanted to bring their friend to Jesus. And they got to this top house where Jesus was teaching, and they saw it was, it was packed with people. There were so many people in there, and they couldn't get in the door. But they wanted to get their friend to Jesus. Their desire to get him to Jesus was so strong that they even climbed up on the roof. Now, back then, you can study this out, you know, the roof was made out of uh, kind of like dirt and and uh, uh, clay and dung and, and sticks, but whatever, that's what the roofs were made out of back then. It's kind of like our neighbor's house right here. I was thinking about that last time. We dig a hole and tell her about Jesus. But uh, uh, hey, I got something to tell you. I got a message from God, you know, to dig a hole right through her, her roof. But anyway, uh, they wanted Jesus. They wanted to bring him to Jesus so bad that they did any, they, they, they even broke the rules, I guess. I mean, they tore up a house. Because they wanted their friend to be thanks to Jesus so Jesus could heal their friend. And they lowered, they said they tore, can you imagine? They started tearing up the roof and then, you know, clay's coming down, stuff's coming down in the middle of the, uh, uh, a meeting. And, and all of a sudden, now the hole's big enough so you can actually see these four guys sticking their heads in there. And now they're lowering their friend down to be in front of Jesus. And Jesus says to them, you know, be healed. Go and sit no more. Boom, you're healed. And God healed them. It was an amazing moment. I want to be part of the four guys. I want in our heart for us to be wanting to bring people to Jesus so bad, we'll do anything short of sin to bring somebody to Jesus. Amen? I said, again, we'll do anything to bring our friends to hear the message of Jesus short of sin. So we, they can know 
the eternal life that we have. You have in you the gift of eternal life. You have God by His Spirit put in you. When you said yes to God, the Spirit of God entered you. And God put in you. You had a confirmation in your spirit. I am now not the old sinner person. I'm a new person in Christ. All things are new. I'm now serving God. Hallelujah. I, now I have in me. I want my friends to know Jesus. I want them, I bet in God brought us to Madison for a reason. God brought you here for a reason. So we can be part of the four. That will, whatever it takes to bring people to Jesus. Amen. I say amen because, like, like Annie said, we kind of been in the South, so everybody responds like amen back, but you don't have to do that. I know we're in Wisconsin, so. So, on your piece of paper, like we've been doing, we, we, we evaluate ourselves. Let's take a moment to really evaluate ourselves, okay? Can we do that? Go look at your piece of paper and just do one through ten. And then on ten would be like Jesus, okay? Ten would be like Jesus. He, he, would, he, he gave his life. For the world. Amen? Maybe we don't have any tens here, but if you're that person, put yourself up there, eight or nine. I'm sharing Jesus. I'm praying for lost people. I'm, I, I'm just, I'm bringing people to church. I'm bringing them to MC. I'm just, I'm dragging people. I'm going to highways and byways. I just can't wait to talk to my neighbor. If that's you, then put yourself up there, eight, nine, ten. That's, that's a good thing. But let me, let's just be honest. You know, maybe we're just, we don't really care. Maybe we're just like, yeah, we, I never pray for anybody that's lost. I don't even have a desire to bring anybody to church. I'm just, I'm just here. I mean, if that's, let's be honest. Let's be honest today, okay? We're talking about eternal life now. We're talking about people that are unsaved, going to hell without us sharing the message of God with them. So just look at it. What a scale. Or maybe once in a while you think about sharing Jesus. Or even if you think about sharing Jesus, you can give yourself a two. Right? You know when the Spirit of God speaks to you about sharing something with somebody, but you don't, right? Anybody been there? <laughs> We've all been there, right? You want to, and then you're scared, right? You're afraid. You don't know what to say. You don't know what's going to happen. Rejection. You don't know what's going to happen. So you're just kind of like, so give yourself a two or three, you know? You, 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 you're hearing that voice, but you're not really doing it. And maybe you're in the middle, where, you're, where you're, yeah, once in a while you bring somebody, maybe you go pick somebody up to bring them to church, maybe you've been, you know, the Holy Spirit will lead on your heart to pray for somebody, that's you, you know? And, and you start praying for them, then maybe you you know, four or five, or whatever. Just evaluate yourself. Take a moment and evaluate yourself. This is really important because we, we as a church, or the church as a whole, the body of Christ, the local church is here not for ourselves. We're here to be light to the world. And I know we have to be encouraged. I know we have to be strengthened. I know all those wonderful things that the body of Christ does for us. But in a, at the whole, the bottom line, what are we here for? Why do we gather together? Because we should strengthen our faith so we can go out and do what God's called us to do. Amen? And God's called every one of us to be... Every one of us. See, I, I was, uh, there's an old uh, saying that, you know, I don't mean to be a cliche, but, I mean, Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for the sins of the world. He did his part. Now it's time for us to do our part. Mm -hmm. Pastor Andrew's going to come and Share with us how we can grow in our passion for the lost. Well, no talking today. You know, sometimes when you plan out a series, you want. Uh, we we're planning out this series particularly, we said we wanted to make sure, you know, we... I'll just talk real for a moment. So we wanted, we, wanted, we wanted to have a series that we could say, okay, we want, we want really high energy. We're going to talk about the values. We want, to, we want to get excited about what God's doing. And, you know, it's been really... Each one of these uh, values that we've gone through so far, it's been really easy to, like, do the cheerleader pom-pom people really excited about, right? And when we're... All this week, I'm writing. I'm trying to take notes. I'm trying to. I'm trying to prepare. I'm trying to make. We we really want this uh, point, this uh, value statement, to be just as exciting and as yeah, let's get them kind of thing, you know, as we did before. And you know, I wanted. I was just debating 
sitting there for a moment, Andrew, are you going to talk real for a moment? Or, you know, we're trying to record each one of these two every week so that we can put a nice little package and have it on our website. You know, if somebody wanted to find out, you know, what are the values of Capital City Church, they can go to our website, they can watch these little videos, and they can see each one and, and really be encouraged and know who we are. And I said, you know, I'm just sitting there and I'm like, this is probably the hardest value to speak on out of every, any value that we could say. I remember being uh, a little kid. We used to go on the, the streets in San, Di in San Diego in Oceanside, California. And every Saturday would be a time that we would, as a family, go and along with some members from the church, we would knock on doors of different people. We'd go to these apartment complexes where some neighborhoods we weren't supposed to be there. And even as a little kid, I was aware that, hey, I'm knocking on people's doors that probably don't uh, really uh, like or enjoy the fact that I'm in their neighborhood. But I would go, and every week it would get more and more exciting as we would knock on the doors and see different little kids come, and, and we would play games with them. And, and we get to share stories with them about who Jesus was. And we get to see people bow their hearts and, and decide, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus. And even as a little kid, as a, as a nine-year-old boy, I remember saying, you know what, I was riding in the car with my grandpa. And my grandfather asked me, Andrew, do you, want to, do you know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is? And I said, yeah, I know that it's a power to be a witness. And I remember asking my grandpa, I said, yeah, grandpa, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I know that I want to be a witness. And I want people to know who Jesus is because Jesus has made a difference in my life. And I know that he is the only hope for the whole world. And I know if I get that right, then it's going to change their whole lives. And so, yeah, Grandpa, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit because, yeah, I want to be a witness. And when we talk about this point, when we say we value leading others to Jesus, we're talking about something that has a power to change people's lives. Yeah. Each one of us in the room, we... We talk about privilege, and, and maybe in our society we talk about privilege a lot, and, and how certain people, or maybe certain situations, give some people more privilege than others. We who have received the words of Christ and have received Jesus, we have a privilege and an honor that those that don't know Him don't have. Amen. We have life. We have the words of life. The reality is, when we talk about this value that we value leading other people to Jesus, the reality is that without Jesus, other people have no life. Without Jesus, there is no life. Without Jesus, there is no hope. Some of us in this room are convinced that the answer to every problem in this world, the answer to every question, the answer to every difficult situation is Jesus. And what we're asking you as a church to believe with us is to believe that the only answer to every problem, the one that can solve all situations, is Jesus. Yes, right. And when we get this down inside of us, it changes how we live. When I go to work, when I go to my neighbors, when I'm interacting with people, sometimes I, I'm guilty of it. Sometimes I use it more as a burden than something as a passion. And I can say, yeah, this is sometimes true of me. But when I see people around me and I know without a shadow of a doubt that they don't know who Jesus is, they haven't submitted their life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, it keeps me up at night. It, it rearranges my schedule. When I was sick, for 36 hours this weekend. I knew Friday night was coming at 7 p.m. that we had arranged with some Chinese people to meet them in the community center at Eagle Heights. And no matter how tired I was and no matter how much lack of energy I had, you know, I said I'm going to be there at 7 o'clock at uh, Eagle yeah. Heights Community Center because yeah. I know there's some people that need Jesus. And I have maybe not all the answers, but I know how to tell them who Jesus is. I don't tell them how great he is. I don't how to tell them how good he is. And if I can just get them to see how good and how great he is, maybe they'll fall in love with Jesus. Maybe they'll taste how good he is by the way that I open up my house. Maybe, maybe they'll taste how good he is by the way that I call them and ask them how they're doing after their wife died uh, unexpectedly of a disease that was unknown to them. Maybe, maybe this is the way that I interact with them and I play games and we get together in a house and we can laugh a little bit that they'll get to experience joy in a way that they haven't experienced yes. before and they get to taste and say, that was Jesus that I experienced in that house. Maybe they get to be around me when I'm interacting with my family and, and they experience a peace that they've never experienced before because all their life they've been in a home where people fight and argue and scream and, and get upset and they've never experienced peace before. For. And when they're around me and my other believing friends, they get to experience a peace. When we talk about valuing leading other people to Jesus, 
It's because we know that He is the hope of the world. And if I don't give people to Jesus, I know they will never receive any other hope. They can put their hope in men, they can put their hope in government, they can put their hope in culture and the way of life that they have, but everything else is going to fail them until they get Jesus. I believe when we talk about getting to our message today, when we get to Mark chapter 2, when we get these four guys that see their paralyzed a friend, they know, and, and it doesn't even, you know, we even, as preachers, we sometimes twist words, they don't, it doesn't even say that they were friends. We try to put that in there as maybe, you know, I mean, we got to get our friend. It, it, it doesn't even say that they're friends. It doesn't even say anything about their relationship with this man. They just knew this paralyzed man has to get to Jesus. That Jesus is the answer to his problem. And no matter what it was that day, no matter what obstacle they had, uh, they were going to get him to Jesus. You know, sometimes we believe obstacles in our lives, barriers that we have, is a sign that, hey, this is going to be too difficult. You know, I'm aware that in workplaces in Madison, especially, that maybe talking about Jesus isn't, the, isn't what we're supposed to be doing during our work time hours. But I believe it's, if we live a life in such a way that we'll demonstrate Jesus, that the people, without a shadow of a doubt, will be curious about why we live the way we do. And discussions about Jesus can be had. And it can be had in a neutral way that's going to draw them to Him. These four men, they said, you know what, we have to be Jesus. And no obstacle could stand in their way from getting them to Jesus. They get to the, the building, and they got a whole bunch of church people. they got a whole bunch of people that already know Jesus, all they already love them, and, and he's preaching to them. He's sharing the word, and the, the house is crowded, right? You know, sometimes I think about, you know, I hope that we as a, uh, as a church, and I know, I know hearts of each, each person in this room, I know that you guys are excited about other people joining in. Man, we're a church that welcomes people, and I love that. We accept others, and no matter what their background is. But I want to encourage us to continue to be a people that don't get so uh, focused on, on God and all of our uh, circumstances and all of our regular rigmarole that other people try to come and try to get to Jesus, and they are met by our backs. You know, we're trying to, we've got our prayer meetings. I love that we pray. Now, I want to do prayer meeting every month. Man, I, I want to do prayer meeting. But, you know, I hope that our prayer meetings or our Sunday morning gatherings and our Bible study time doesn't just come a Bible study time where it's just us and where the other people are wanting to get into Jesus, the one thing that they need to have hope, but they can't get in because we're too busy doing our Christian thing, right? We, we want to be people that no matter what the obstacle is, that's standing in front of our uh, friends and our loved ones and those that we're coming in contact with, that they can get to Jesus. Pastor mentioned a little bit about the construction of the roof that they had to dig through. You know, it had some soil, you know, it had some dirt, some mud, some sticks, and different things, but there's also some manure in there. There's some, there some poo in there. There's some fertilizer, because just like our, our neighbor's house, they had, a, they had a garden up there. They had plants that were growing on top of their house. One of my uh, preachers that I was listening to, he said, sometimes you have, to, you, have to get a, you have to deal with a little bit of poo to give somebody to Jesus. I'm not saying getting people to Jesus is an easy thing. Sometimes we've got to deal with some people's issues. Sometimes they're a little bit of a mess. But when we get them to Jesus, when we get them to Jesus, everything changes. Each one of us can know about different friends or different stories that we know. Maybe it's even our own personal story. We know, hey, there was a mess that, that God had to get through. And then once he, he got there, and, then, and he changed me. And now, man, I want that same cleanse, that same joy, that same freedom that I've experienced. I want other people to experience that same thing. Because, yeah, I was, I was that messy person, too. Yeah. Somebody had to come alongside me and, and deal with my messiness and help me get to Jesus. Help me get cleaned up. And I want to return that favor. I want to, I want to continue that work. Same thing that I've done to this. So some of us, uh, if we're talking about how we're going to do this, how we're going to make this a value in our lives, that we're going to lead others and people to Jesus, it starts with one, bearing other people's burdens. Getting to know people. How do we get to the point where we get to talk about Jesus? Who, if we're honest, the cross of Jesus, the subject of Jesus, is, is offensive. It does come at who we are, right? Where does it start? It starts with bearing some burdens. They get to know our, 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 friend, our neighbors, our, our co-workers, people around us. Yeah. I, I know that you guys uh, could never guess this, but I've never been 
never been told I'm an introvert. <laughs> never, never, never been told that, right? Never, never. Um, sometimes we can use who we are, sometimes as an excuse. And I'll go, Andrew, you're an expert telling me this. I'm an introvert. You don't know the, the, the struggles. I can read the articles too. I, I get the jokes. I get it. Sometimes it's easier just I can go do my thing and I'm comfortable with that, right? Yeah. For the sake of the world, for the sake of the people, I want to bear some burden. I want to get to know somebody. We're a city on a hill, right? A light. Nobody lights a candle, puts it under a basket. Yeah. Part of this, if we're gonna, if we're gonna give people to Jesus, we gotta know what they need. And when we start knowing what they need, we get to start pointing them to the Jesus that we know and how we can answer that need. Financial, relational, addictions. I mean, come on. People just sad. Had an opportunity just this week. Now I'm working. Now they, now they made me a manager over at Curry in the Box. Went from, went from uh, expo to, to social media, now I'm manager, VA. More responsibilities, right? So uh, <laughs> we, uh, there was a, a guest that came in a, a week ago and came in around 9 o'clock at night. And we, if you don't know, Creative Box closes at 9. He came at like 9, uh, 8.58 and ordered, <laughs> ordered a meal, right? There is a gentleman is sitting there uh, in our dining room. We're closed. You know, I, I turn off. You know, the other lights. And all the cooks are gone. And um, I noticed he had a couple tattoos on his sleeve, on his arm, his sleeves, and uh, they were Hebrew. I was like, that's really. I mean, I don't see a lot of people with Hebrew tattoos here in Madison. I mean, maybe when I was down in North Carolina, Missouri, you know, writing scriptures on your arms. That was a really big thing. But I haven't seen that very often in Madison. And uh, so I. I was working up, you know, I'm like, I'm a manager, I'm at work, I'm on the clock, you know, all these different things. It went through my head, too. I'm not saying it doesn't go through my head, it does. I said, i got to ask him. And I just kept them seeing it. I said, hey, I saw those tattoos. Said, what, what are they? I didn't tell him I knew it was Hebrew or anything like that. And, and uh, he tells me, yeah, this scripture, it was one, um, uh, one of it was the Old Testament scripture, and then one was Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, great. And he said, yeah, one of my father passed away, uh, I, I made a commitment to get these tattoos to remind me of who he, who he was as a man. Oh, wow, interesting. And then he went on to proceed to tell me a very personal story about who he is and the rejection that he's faced and how he's uh, moved to Madison just recently, running away from uh, wanting to start over from a life that he's had. And sometimes all it takes is the question of concern of care. To start this journey of, of bearing somebody's burden. So when, when we talk about do we value leading others to Jesus, it starts one with bearing people's burdens. It doesn't say it doesn't say that these gentlemen were this paralyzed man friend. It said that they cared about him. They knew the answer was Jesus. All right, number two. Number two, sometimes we've got to do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. I know that requires, as the pastor said earlier, break some rules. Uh, sometimes it takes some, break some cultural things. Uh, sometimes it, I talk about introvert, extrovert, who I am, person that. Sometimes it takes getting out of who I am so we can see other people get to Jesus. traditionally do and say, you know, i got to get it. somebody to Jesus. No matter what the obstacle is, sometimes we try to take obstacles, we say it's uh, 
you know, a sign that God doesn't want us to do it. No, the obstacle is sometimes it's just a challenge. I think I want to close at, at this moment. These, uh, these, Jewish, these, these Jewish guys that said, you know, no matter what, i got to get my friends to Jesus. They, they cared enough about the burdens of somebody else to say, you know what, I know uh, I can get you to Jesus. Uh, I'm going to do whatever it takes. So they cared about him enough to carry him all the way there, carry him where they broke some, they broke some cultural things, man. They're tearing up somebody's house just so they can get somebody to Jesus. Sometimes it takes us to step out to break some cultural things, break a little bit of who I am, because hey, even though I'm not comfortable, I know that uh, i got to get them to Jesus, and I I'm convinced of that. It this morning, I don't know what else I could say. I really don't. I got, I got some more notes here, but I just, sometimes we gotta do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. The people need to Jesus. They need some hope. We talk about this, this past week, just in America, just like, man, there's some people that need some hope, need some love, need some Jesus. We got the best thing ever. We used to sing a song when I was in college. It said, break my heart for what breaks yours. And so this morning, I, I know, I said, I want to make, I want to leave this on a happy note. But you know what I do? I see us as a church that, that gets this. And I see us as a church that no matter, no matter what, I want to give people to Jesus. I'm, I'm going to get them in my house. I'm going to tear about Jesus. I'm going to get them out to eat. I'm going to have lunch with them. I, mean, I see us. As, I see that as a church. I see us getting this. And I, no matter what it is, I'm going to get them here on Sunday morning. I'm going to get them in my If I can't, if I, I, I don't feel the boldness to, to share, man, I'm going to get Andrew. Or I'm going to get Linda. I'm going to get some other brothers from my MC. I'm going to get some people around me that, that can help me share this Jesus thing. But I know, I see this. I see us as a church. I see us growing as this. I believe we can do it. I love that. The, the plane comes in, is landing, and they confirm how many people they have on board. Man, I believe we have a church on board with us. Yes. Getting ready to make disciples to, to lead Madison to Jesus. And what I love about the city of Madison is that we're not just going to uh, affect people from Wisconsin, man, we get to expect people from China. I mean, we as a church, we said we're a multicultural family service because we believe the nations that are represented here in Madison, and the cultures that are represented here in Madison, man, uh, we're going to see them come to Jesus. And when they go back to whatever place uh, they're from, when they get jobs, other places around the world, man, it's going to be like us sending missionaries all over the globe. It's, it's going to be awesome. It's great. I love what we get to do here in Madison. I love that we're doing it here with you guys. But let's take a moment and pray. Because I believe God wants to do something significant in our hearts this morning. You know, we talk about all the values that we want. But you know what? It's about Jesus. And it's about getting other people to Jesus. But as we're evaluating this, some of, some of us would say, you know what? Uh, I, I need more Jesus. <laughs> I need more Jesus in my life. I need to get cleaned up. I need Him this morning. So I want to give an opportunity for us to repent. And repent is a nice biblical word, but it's true. It means a turning of my ways, a, a, a changing of my thinking. I change the way I think about something, and it changes the way I live. That's what repentance is. It's not just stop doing it. Stop it. Do this instead. No. It's a, I'm, I'm convinced in my mind this is a better way to live. This is the right thing to do. And then it influences this morning I want to say the reason why I'm so excited about Jesus is because I know that he, I know his love and I've experienced it in such a way that it's changed my life. And so this morning, if you're in this room and you say, you know what, Andrew, I, I need to get some things right with Jesus. I need to come to Jesus. I need to get cleaned up. I need to hear from him. Your faith has healed you. Go and sin more, no more. I need to get cleaned up a little bit. Yes. Maybe you've never asked God, God, would you clean me up? Maybe you're reminded, yeah, you know, God, I, I need to look more like you, Jesus.
just a moment, I want to pray and I want to invite you to say, God, come clean me up. Jesus, I want to make my life all about you. 